بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك مظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد One of the greatest dangers that society faces is not necessarily bombs or a nuclear explosion or a terrorist attack but it is the falling of the family the deteriorating family structure the rise in the problems within the marriages and the family this is perhaps a greater problem and a greater disaster towards society than the wars. Because this is very close to us. Wars, not many people are affected by wars. But family problems, you see, almost everyone is affected with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran that even some of the prophets of Allah, even some of the prophets, they are the awliya, they are the closest ones to Allah, they also had family problems. So the issue of the family and the issue of marriage problems is an issue that is a danger to society, to a person's life, to a person's health. You see someone who is struggling within the family, that affects their health. You see they'll have high blood pressure, they'll have heart problems, they'll have stress, it has an impact on a person's social life. People begin speaking about a person. If a person does not have a solid, sound family, you see he becomes or she becomes the talk of the town. Everyone starts talking about this person. And the religion of Islam tells us that if a family is not healthy, 
this will also have an impact on a person's afterlife. It will also have an impact on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduhan nasu wal hijara. O you people who believe, strengthen yourself and your family from the fire that is fueled by rocks and people. Allah says, strengthen yourself, but don't only take yourself to paradise. Also think about your family. Think about the people around you. Think about your spouse. Take people, take as much people as you can with you to paradise. And when we gather to remember Imam Hussein alayhi salam, this is the lesson that we learn. Because when we look at the lives of the prophets and the imams, we see that they invested in their family just as much as they invested in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as they invested in their prayer, in their salah, in their zakat, in their hajj, you see that the prophets and the anbiya and the imams, they constantly did dua for their family. Look at Zakaria, he prays that Allah gives him a dhurriyah. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, at an old age, he does dua, so Allah gives him a progeny. And look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who also does dua for a progeny, does dua for a family. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا This is the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Praying to have a sound family, to have a healthy family structure. However, today, when we look at the statistics, when we look at the studies, we see the rising divorce rate, the rising family problems within the Muslims. We used to think that the Muslims were immune. We used to think that there were no problems within the Muslims, and it was just others that were going through family problems. But you look at many people around you, you hear stories from here and there, and you see many people are getting divorced. I read a study, and this is an old study. This is probably 15 years old. Now the number is definitely higher. It says that the divorce rate within the Muslims is 31%. And I'm sure the number is much higher than that. Not much higher, but it is probably higher than that. So... The Muslims are not immune to family problems. And we see that the religion of Islam and the Quran and the Prophet and the teachings of Islam, they stress upon the family. Look at what we hear during the month of Muharram. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, if he would have gone alone in Karbala by himself, and he would have been killed on the day of Ashura, today we would not be gathered here. It was because of the family of Imam al Hussein. It was because of the women and the children of Imam al Hussein. That was the investment that Imam al Hussein had in his family that saved the religion of Islam. And you could also invest in your family by saving your own faith and helping the religion of Islam grow. So when we gather during these nights in the month of Muharram, we're not just gathering to remember a man from who died, who was killed 1,400 years ago. We're not just gathering to strengthen our aqidah, our ideology. We're also going to learn how to strengthen our relationship with our own families, with our own loved ones. This is one of the main lessons of Muharram. The religion of Islam sees the family as an ho a holy institution. It has a sanctity. Maybe this society or others, other places, they do not look at marriage as a holy institution. And this is why they have legalized it for whoever wants to come and consider it a marriage. They say, yes, go ahead, as long as the government allows it, as long as they're in love, let two guys, two women, whatever it is, let them go ahead and get married. But the religion of Islam sees that marriage has a sanctity. It's a holy institution. مَا بُنِيَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِنَاءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنَ التَّزْوِيجِ This is a hadith of Rasulullah 
No foundation, no institution has been built in the religion of Islam more beloved to Allah than the institution of family and marriage. It's a holy institution. Perhaps it is holier than building a masjid. Because we might build a masjid and the masjid might be empty. But when you invest in a family, you will have generations that will build masjids and that will attend the masjids. Investing in a family, it is the most important institution in the religion of Islam. And there are requirements to have a successful marriage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the marriage as one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the miracles of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ From the signs of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا This is one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to see a successful marriage, if you want to have a successful marriage, you have to invest in a marriage. You have to sanctify the marriage before you enter into a marriage. Because the religion of Islam, it sanctifies the marriage. And we, we look at the best role models. The best marriage in the religion of Islam was the marriage of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra alayhim as-salam. These Ahl al-Bayt, which this marriage it took place in the heavens before it took place on earth. After the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Amir al-Mu'mineen used to always cry. Why? Because he had lost a partner who was so loving, who he felt so attached to. This is the Islamic marriage, the marriage of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam He used to cry. Many years later, Ammar, the companions, they would ask Amir al-Mu'mineen, they would tell him, Oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, you teach us patience, but we see you, you continue crying. You continue crying for Fatima. He says, Fawallah, ma aghabtuha, wa la akrahtuha, ala amrin, hatta qababaha Allah azza wa jal. He says, and how we had a special relationship, Fatima and I. In that relationship, I never forced her to do anything. I never angered her. I never oppressed her. And then he says, وَلَا أَغْضَبَتْنِي وَلَا عَصَتْلِي أَمْرًا And she also never made me angry. Throughout this whole time we were married, not one time did I become angry with Fatima. And not one time did she ever go against what I say. Did she ever disobey anything that I'm saying. And then he says, وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَنظُرْ إِلَيْهَا فَتَنْكَشِفُ عَنِّيَ الْهُمُومِ وَالْأَحْزَانِ And I used to just look at her face and I would forget all of my problems and all of my worries. This is Fatima alayhi salam. This is that marriage, that holy marriage. And that marriage, it did not come out of nowhere. That marriage, there were many challenges. There were many problems and difficulties that the Ahlul Bayt went through. They did not have an easy lifestyle. The Ahlul Bayt, Rasulullah, their lifestyle was not easy, but they worked. They strived to build a healthy marriage. They strived to build a successful marriage. And this is what we have to do in order to achieve a healthy marriage. There are a few ingredients for a successful marriage. The first is that before you get married, and when you are married, you have to take marriage seriously. Marriage, it's an institution that must be taken seriously. It cannot be seen as a joke. It cannot be seen as, I'm just getting married. You know, in our cultures, the older generations, a man, and a woman, as soon as their body is physically capable of getting married, as soon as they grow, they tell them, okay, now you have to get married. It was just about being physically capable of getting married. And then they would go and marry a person off. Maybe it used to work back then. 
But now, the struggles and the challenges that a marriage faces, you will not survive by just getting a two people married. The marriage will not survive by just getting two people married that are not ready to get married. Today, you see many youth, they're old. Their body is physically capable of getting married, but psychologically and mentally, they're not ready to get married. In order to get married, one has to be committed. And this is the first thing that a marriage requires. This is the first ingredient. It requires commitment. It requires a person to be independent and make decisions. It requires a person to honor the marriage. You see some people, they're married, but they act like they're single. They act like they're not married. This, is, this will definitely cause a failed marriage. It will cause problems within the family and problems within the marriage. So this is the first ingredient. Second is that there has to be compatibility. When choosing a spouse, when choosing someone to marry, there has to be takafut, compatibility. And this is an issue that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi stressed about. This is an issue that is mentioned in the Quran. When you get married, you have to marry someone who is with the same mentality and same mindset, same type of thinking. Otherwise, if you bring two people, one is thinking some, something and another one, their thinking is at a completely different level. It will cause problems. There has to be compatibility when it comes to education, when it comes to thinking, when it comes to the mindset. This is very important. Today, many of the divorces, they'll tell you, and especially within the Muslim community, they'll tell you that I'm educated. The man will say I'm educated and my wife is not educated. Therefore, there's no compatibility within us. And therefore, he tries to justify for himself to go and start another relationship. This is a serious problem. Why? Because they try to say that there is no compatibility. Now, who caused this? This is why the religion of Islam stresses on the issue of education. Everyone has to be educated. The men and the women, by our cultures, they say, no, 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 let the women not be educated and let the man just be educated. Just focusing on the man being educated, and then later on, when problems emerge, later on when the, in the marriage, when problems emerge, they'll say there's no compatibility. Compatibility on everything. This is very, a very important issue. Finding someone at the same thinking level, same mentality, but then there are some priorities. Some people... They say, we want compatibility, but then their priority is that I want someone who is good looking. This is, the, this is their top priority. Someone who is extremely good looking. There's nothing wrong with looking for someone who is very good looking. But then, is that the most important thing that you're looking for in a marriage? A hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, من تزوج امرأة لمالها أو جمالها فله ذلك. If someone marries a lady just for her beauty or for her wealth, then that's all that he's going to get out of. That's all that he's going to get out of that marriage. But if he has a different priority, and that is the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa taala and other priorities, then he will have the both worlds. And also today. We see many problems emerge when a man, he goes and he proposes and the first question that he is asked by the girl or the girl's family is how much money do you have in your bank account? What kind of a car do you drive? What are your investments? This is the first priority that many people think about. This is looking for a doomed marriage. This is looking for a problem later on in life. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he has a beautiful hadith. He says, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ 
فزوجوه وإن لم تفعلوا تكن فتنة في الأرض وفساد كبير. He says when someone comes and proposes and he's a mu'min, he's a believer and he has good akhlaq, allow him. It's okay. Let him marry him off because if you don't, there will be a fitna, there will be a problem. Why? Because the religious, the one who sees himself religious, he will say that I go and I propose and I keep getting rejected. Then he's going to leave the religion. He's going to start sinning. He's going to start looking for other types of relig relationships, illegitimate relationships. And same for the girl. So the first priority, according to the religion of Islam, according to the Quran, should be the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if there is no compatibility when it comes to the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will see that there will be problems. Problems will emerge later on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this issue in the Quran. At that time, during the time of the Prophet, there were some slaves. The religion of Islam it abolished, slowly it abolished slavery, but there were slaves at that time. So Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا أَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ if you, if you were to go and marry a female slave who is a mu'min, this is better than marrying a free mushrika, even if she is beautiful, even if you wanted her. And then Allah also says the same thing for the men. وَلَا عَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ مُشْرِكٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَ and trusting and allowing a slave who happens to be a mu'min, a mu'min who happens to be a slave, allowing him to marry is better than giving your daughter to a mushrik. Even if you like the mushrik, even if you thought that the mushrik is rich, even if you thought that the mushrik can probably bring more happiness later on. And then Allah says in the Quran, أُولَٰئِكَ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Those, they call for the hellfire, they will lead a relationship into the hellfire, and a mu'min will lead a relationship to paradise. Go and look at the lives of the prophets. Allah mentions a story of two prophets. Two stories of two prophets. They were prophets. But there was no compatibility in that marriage. The wife, the wives of Lut and the wife of Nuh. The wife of Lut and the wife of Nuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they're an example. They're an example for the kuffar of how two women who were the wives of the prophets, but just being the wife of the prophet, it did not save them. And they where they, their ultimate end is the hellfire because of their actions, because there was no compatibility. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also speaks about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rasulullah, Allah threatens in one verse the wives of the Prophet. Allah tells the Prophet, Ya ayyuhal nabi qul li azwajik. O Prophet, tell your wives, إِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدْنَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتَهَا فَتَعَالَيْنَ أُمَتِّعْكُنَّ وَأُسَرَّحْكُنَّ سَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا Tell the, wife, the wives of the Prophet, if you are looking for this life and the enjoyment of this life, then the Prophet says, tell your wives I will divorce you right now. Because the Prophet was living a completely different lifestyle. And then the verse it continues and it says, وَإِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَدَّ لِلْمُحْسِنَاتِ مِنْ كُنَّ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا However, if you want the afterlife, then you will stay with Rasulullah and Allah will reward you. So even when it came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Allah orders him to find compatibility within his own family. So the issue of compatibility is a very important issue. Third, the third ingredient for a successful marriage is patience. 
It might be something very easy to say, just be patient. But it's very difficult to actually be patient. You know, many times we tell people, or people tell us, be patient, it's okay, asbar. But that patience, it's very difficult. Not many people are patient. In fact, most people are not patient. But the hadith of Rasulullah says, As-sabr min al-iman karra'si min al-badan. Patience to faith is like the head from the body. They have to be with one another. Faith without patience will not last. And patience without faith also will not last. So the, the main ingredient, a very important ingredient for marriage is that there has to be patience within the family. And if there is no patience within a family, you see that the marriage will crumble. The, the marriage, it will fall apart. And the spouses within the marriage, they will be living a life of misery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the whole purpose of marriage is so that people live in tranquility. Allah says in the Quran, in the verse that we recited earlier, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا For what? لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you find sukoon. So that you find tranquility. But when a marriage has no tranquility, it will be defeating the purpose. It will go against the whole purpose of marriage in the Quran. The purpose of marriage is so that there's sukoon, there's tranquility within the family. There has to be patience. And of course, no marriage goes without problems, goes without struggles. But Allah says in the Quran, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى With difficulty comes ease. And Allah repeats this verse again. And indeed, with difficulty comes ease. But you see sometimes, there's no patience, and it leads to aggression. It leads to verbal assaults. Within the marriage, that institution that is supposed to be a place of love, it leads to verbal assaults and sometimes it even leads to violence. I don't know if you remember last year in Dearborn, a man, he's mowing the lawn, he's working in the lawn, his wife, she pulls up in the car. One second, one second of anger, he goes and he is arguing with his wife. Then he goes and he takes a gun and he shoots her in front of the children. And then he shoots himself as well. Within one minute, these children, they lost their father and their mother because there was no patience. Because it was a moment of anger. And of course, this is something that is very common, although it is hidden. Not many people know about it, but studies show that in the United States, every nine seconds, a female is assaulted. So it causes problems. And just the lack of patience, the lack of respect within a family, it could lead to catastrophes, problems. What will, you know, what's the solution? Sometimes one moment of anger, it can bring so much regret, a lifetime of regret. And of course, this abuse, sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes we see the woman there abusing the man. There was a man, one day he goes to work with a black eye. So they told him, what's wrong? He said, nothing. You know, he tried to hide it. He said, nothing, nothing happened. What happened? You have a black eye. He said, no, my wife, she gave me roses. He said, they told him, she gave you roses? Roses, they don't cause a black eye. He said, yes, she just forgot to take them out of the vase. So she threw the whole vase at him. And he had a black eye. This is an issue of patience. Being patient, it also requires that sometimes, it's not just not causing problems. Being patient requires that you show love and affection because this is also the marriage. Sometimes it's difficult to show love and affection, but it requires patience. And there are many narrations that speak about this issue. 
showing love and affection towards the family. In a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says that when a man, قول الرجل لزوجته إني أحبك لا يذهب عن قلبها أبدا. When a man tells his wife, I love you, this does not leave her heart. And you see Rasulullah, he had to speak to the Arabs at that time. Because sometimes for some men, it's very difficult to just say, I love you. Rasulullah, he had to even teach them how to have, how to live a successful marriage. One day a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and he told him, Inna li zawja, I have a wife. When I enter, she welcomes me. And when I leave, she walks me to the door. And when she sees that I'm going through problems, I'm, de I'm depressed, I'm sad, she tells me, What's wrong? In kunta tahtam lirizqik. If you are worried about your ghazab, your sustenance, don't worry about that. Allah will provide for you. But if you are worried about your afterlife, then you should worry about that. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he told the man, Bashirha bil jannah. Go and tell her that she will go to paradise. For that small action. That action. بَشِّرْهَا بِالْجَنَّةِ وَقُلْ لَهَا إِنَّكِ عَامِلَةَ مِنْ عُمَّالِ اللَّهِ وَلَكِ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمِ أَجْرُ سَبْعِينَ شَهِيدٍ You are one person who is working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every day that you do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you the, ro the reward of a shaheed. The reward of 70 martyrs in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the third. Fourth, a relationship, a successful relationship should not be based off of selfish desires. What leads to divorce? Divorce is when one person refuses to give in. One person just wants to walk out of the family. One person says, no, it's just me, and they're only worried about themselves. Of course, this is not all the cases of divorce, but many times this is how it is. When one person decides to leave, it's not both of them are leaving. Selfish desires. They could be very damaging to a relationship. Sometimes you see someone in a family, he's married, but he only wants to have fun. He only wants to travel. He only wants to go the places that are fun and travel. This is damaging to a relationship. Or someone who, the husband is, or one of the couple, today men and women are both working, so you can't just say the husband. One of them is working, and the other one, the whole day is at the mall. Spending, spending at the mall, spending the money of the other one who's working. Isn't this selfish? One is working and the other is just spending? It's America, yes. <laughs> this was the fourth. The fifth is the, first, the fifth thing that damages a relationship and damages a marriage is greed. Al-Bukhul. When someone is greedy, it will cause problems. Of course, we're talking about someone who is capable of giving and does not give. Sometimes someone who doesn't have. Sometimes Amir al-Mu'mineen, he used to come home, he sees there's nothing in the house, and he does not have anything. But he used to go and work and bring back one dirham. Amir al-Mu'mineen was very generous. But then sometimes you see someone who has, but yet they're very greedy. They're very stingy with the family. This also causes problems. And the hadith says, لَيْسَ لِبَخِيلٍ حَبِيبٍ Someone who is, who is greedy and stingy, this person will not have a habib. This person will not have anyone that likes this person. Even if he's a mu'min, he's a religious person, he prays. But no one wants to be around someone who is stingy, someone who refuses to give. And the hadith from Rasulullah says, 
البخيل بعيد من الله بعيد من الناس بعيد من الجنة the بخيل the greedy person he is away from Allah he is away from the people and he is away from paradise and then the hadith also says والسخي the kareem the generous person قريب من الله قريب من الناس قريب من الجنة the one who is generous you see Allah loves this person he's constantly giving he's constantly helping out other people he's close to society everyone loves this person and he's close to paradise of course we're talking about the giving that falls within the it's a proportionate giving there was a man during the life of Rasulullah he gave away all of his money then he died Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he saw and he heard that his children were begging in the streets. He heard that his children were begging in the streets. So Rasulullah said, where's their father? They told him, their father, he gave away all his money to the poor people and he died. He's such a good person, he gave away all his money. Rasulullah said, if I had known, I would not have allowed that person to be buried in a Muslim cemetery. Meaning that what he did was so wrong, leaving his own children. Allah says, Al Aqrabuna awla bil ma'roof. Your family should be prioritized. You give after you give your own family, after you give your aqrabun. That is the giving, that is the generosity. So this is the this is the uh, fifth. The fifth is that a greedy person, a greedy person will destroy a marriage. The sixth and the final is that the marriage should not be taken lightly. There are responsibilities when it comes to building a family. That institution, that holy institution, it should not be taken lightly. Many people, they don't care about their marriage. They don't care about problems. When someone is not happy in the marriage, in, the inst in that family, they don't care, they're careless. Are you going to do the same thing when, you're, when your boss is unhappy with you? Are you going to do the same thing when your co-workers are unhappy with you? No, because that risks your life, that, risk, that risks your job, that risks your income. Marriage should be taken the same way. The same way we treat our job, we go from nine to five, we are committed, we go on time. The family should also be respected when it comes to time. When it comes to spending time with them, when it comes to talking to them, do you talk to your family the same way you talk to your boss? Or you're afraid of your boss? You're afraid that you're going to get fired if you show some disrespect. Would you do the same thing when it comes to your family? When, mar when getting married, you're signing a contract. Just like when you sign up for a job, you're signing a contract. But that contract of the marriage is seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one that is bringing those two together. Therefore, the institution of the marriage is a holier institution than anything else. And it should not be taken lightly in the way that the marriage should be respected. And in order to respect the marriage, in order to show love to the family, you have to be worried about the afterlife of the family. Some people, they'll put a roof over their family's head, they'll bring the best car, they'll bring the best clothes. But then you ask them, what have you done to prepare your children, to prepare your wife, your husband, for the afterlife? They say nothing. They have not done anything. This is a very important issue. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارًا Oh, you people who believe Strengthen yourself from the and protect yourself and protect your family from the hellfire. Yes, you care about the future of your family, the future of that institution. You should also care about the afterlife. That is the eternal future. And here, when we look at the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, when we look at the Prophets, we see that their advice to their family, their advice to their children, it had to do more with the afterlife than this life.
Because this life, you could always get something to eat. You could always get something to wear. You're not going to die out of hunger. But you will suffer if you're not ready for the afterlife. Ibrahim alayhi salam, that prophet of Allah, he came and he brought his family, his wife, Hajar, and Ismail, he came and he placed them in Mecca, in a land that has no grass, it has no water, it has nothing. Why? He says in the Quran, he says, Rabbi inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zar'ah. Oh Allah, I have left my family in a valley that has no grass. And there was no water at that time in Mecca. Why? Rabbana liyuqimu salat. Oh Allah, this is so that they pray to you. This is so that they build a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the struggle of Prophet Ibrahim. Nuh alayhi salam, he advises his son. Rasulullah, he advises his family. He used to stand at the door of Fatima al-Zahra and Amir al-Mu'mineen every day. The last six months, some narrations say eight months of his life, every day before prayer. And he would say, Assalamu alaykum ya ahla bayt al-nubuwa wa ma'adil al-rasala wa mukhtalaf al-mala'ika as-salah as-salah. It's prayer time. This is a prophet. This is someone who cares about the future of his family. When you care about your family, you care about the prayer of your family. You care about the akhlaq of your family. Luqman, Allah gives us an example of Luqman who advises his son. He tells him, stay away from shirk, associating a partner with Allah, because that is the greatest act of oppression. And also, we look at the Ansar of Imam al Hussein. The companions of Imam al Hussein, they were not all men. There were families that were with Rasulullah. The Shuhada on the day of Ashura, there were families. There were some women that died with Imam al Hussein. There were families that came. Sometimes it took for a wife to convince her, her husband to go and sacrifice, to go and defend Imam al Hussein. Some men, their wives were against them participating with Imam al Hussein. It took a struggle within the family. One of the companions of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, this family, they were a Christian family, Wahab al Kalbi. While Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, was traveling, this family, they were traveling with the, they were traveling, and suddenly they saw the camp and the caravan of Imam al Hussein. So they saw Imam al Hussein and they heard from Imam al Hussein, they joined the religion of Islam. They joined the religion of Islam days or weeks before Ashura. And then they brought their caravan with the caravan of Imam al Hussein and they started traveling with Imam al Hussein. Wahab and his mother and his wife who he had just married. He had just married her. They reached, they were with Imam Hussein, then they saw that there was a, an army that intercepted the army of Imam Hussein, and Imam Hussein was in Karbala all alone, there was no water. Many people, they left Imam Hussein, but this family, they decided to stay with Abba Abdullah. They had just converted to the religion of Islam. On the day of Ashura, Wahab, he has just gotten married, but his mother comes to him, she tells him, Oh Wahab, and here you see the role of the family. She tells him, Oh Wahab, we have just joined this beautiful religion. What do you say you go and you sacrifice yourself, defending the Imam of our time? He tells her, Yes, I will do so. But his wife, who he had just married her, she tells him, oh Wahab, you're going to leave me just like that. We just got married. You're going to just leave me just like that. Wahab, he saw that Imam al Hussein was in need and he saw that the companions of Imam al Hussein they were dying one after the other. He decided on going and fighting. On one side, his mother is cheering him. She's telling him, fight. On one side, his wife, she's telling him, oh Wahab, you're going to leave me. He continues to fight courageously until 
Suddenly he hears his wife. He hears his wife telling him, Ya wahab qatil dun al-tayyibin wa abna al-tayyibin. Oh wahab, fight courageously. Defend the household of Rasulullah. Wahab, he comes back. He tells her, you were just telling me to not fight. You were just telling me to stay away and not fight. She tells him, Ya Wahab, la talumni in nawa'iyat al-Husayn qatta'at niyat wa qalbi. Oh Wahab, do not blame me. I just heard Aba Abdullah standing by the tent. He's calling, Ala hal min nasr an yansurna. Ala hal min mu'in an yu'inuna. Hal min da'ab an yadubbu an harami rasulillah. Is there anyone that will protect us? Go Wahab, fight in the way of Aba Abdullah. Wahab, he fought courageously until he was killed. And then they say that suddenly his wife, she took a spear from a tent and she began to run towards the enemies. She began to fight with the enemies until she was also killed. She was the first shahida on that day, the day of Ashura. This couple who had just married, both of them became shuhada in the way of Aba Abdullah. There was another man, as we are remembering the Ansar of Imam al-Husayn, there was another young boy, a boy who was 13 years old. This young boy, Amr ibn Junad al-Ansari, his father has just been killed in the battle, and he was with his mother. He comes to Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam He asks for permission to fight. Imam al-Husayn, he sends him back. He says, take him back to his mother. The boy, he goes back crying to his mother. His mother, she had sent him to Imam al-Husayn. And then he comes to Imam al-Husayn. He tells him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Inna ummi hiya allati albasatni la'matu harbi. It was my mother who sent me to you. Then his mother comes. She says, Oh Aba Abdullah, Atuthkal ummuka al-zahra bi waladiha. Wala uthkal bi waladi. Your mother will lose her son and I do not lose my son, how can I stand in front of Fatima on the Day of Judgment? This young boy, who was only 13 years old, he carries his sword, he goes in the battle and he begins introducing himself. Everyone, they would talk about which lineage they're from, which family they're from. This young man, he goes and says, Amiri Hussein wa ni'mal Amir. I don't, I don't have a family, I don't attribute myself to my family, but I have an Amir who is Hussein. Amiri Hussein wa ni'mal Amir. Surur Fuad al Bashir al Nadir. Ali wa Fatima wa Lida. They fight him until they kill him and they throw his head to his mother. His mother, she holds on to the head. She wipes away the dirt from the head of her son and she says, May Allah brighten your face in front of Rasulullah just like you brighten my face in front of Fatima. On the day of Ashura, after all of the companions were killed, Imam al Hussein he stood all alone, wahidan gariba, la nasran wa la mu'ina. He began to call his companions one after the other by their name, Ya Habib ibn Mudahir, Ya Muslim ibn Awsajah, Ya Zuhair, Ya Burhair. He called them all. 
There was no reply. Then he says, Ya Abdal al-Safa wa Ya Fursan al-Hayja and Ya Mun Antum Arjukum Tantabhoon Am Halat Baynakum wa Bayna Imamikum Qumu An Naumatikum Ya Kiram Wa Adfa'u An Aram Al-Rasul Al-Tugat Al-Liam Ala Wallah لقد صرعكم والله ريب المنون وإلا لما كنتم عن نصرتي تقصرون لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير We're also asked to recite this, this verse three times for the shifa of the marir بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهر